In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmering and Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the Estate of Richard W. Wyland, Dewey and LaBeouf, and these funders, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you. From its first episode in 1992, In the Life has told the stories of groups and individuals that reflect the full spectrum of the LGBT community. This month, as we remember Martin Luther King's vision of equality and the African American Civil Rights Movement, we look back at inspiring portraits of people who stood up, spoke out, and made a difference in the struggle for full LGBT equality. We brought everybody together. Act up! Healthcare is right! And we're married! There was nothing for him to hide. Make a promise. Earlier this year, the United States Senate voted to confirm both Paul Etkin, a gay man, and Allison Nathan, an out lesbian, to join U.S. District Court Judge Deborah Batts on the bench of the Southern District of New York. More than a decade ago, In the Life correspondent Jonathan Capehart was there, spending a day in the life of Judge Batts. My name is Deborah A. Batts, and my title is United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. How many doctors have been involved? As a district court judge, I have jurisdiction over an incredible variety of cases. I have civil cases as well as criminal cases. The Honorable Deborah Batts became the country's first openly gay federal judge in 1994, having been recommended for the bench by Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York. I was asked if I would be interested in submitting an application to be considered for a federal uh, district court judgeship. Uh, I was delighted. I said yes. I was sent the application. Uh, I filled it out. Uh, I met with Senator Moynihan. However, change in the country's political climate was necessary before the application was given serious consideration. The Bush Department of Justice or administration felt that while they thought I was very nice that my view of what a federal judge should be was not uh, what their view of a federal judge should be. The President of the United States. When President Clinton was elected in 1992, Batts' nomination finally moved forward. Early on, the administration made clear that they wanted to seek out a diverse slate of candidates, including openly gay or lesbian uh, candidates for the federal bench. Finally, I was nominated by uh, President Clinton and uh, was sworn in as a federal district court judge June 23, 1994, which was during Gay Pride Week. The ease with which an openly gay candidate won confirmation to the federal bench took many legal observers by surprise. Please be seated. Still, many felt that her confirmation had more to do with her credentials than it did with a tolerant Congress. Batts was an openly lesbian tenured professor at Fordham Law School who had taught there for, I, I think, 10 or more years and um, had a very uh, prestigious resume before that. She was at a prestigious law firm. She worked at the U.S. Attorney. This matter is adjourned. Batts studied government at Radcliffe College, then went on to graduate from Harvard Law School at a time when radical changes were sweeping the country. I think that the timing of it, the assassination of Robert uh, Kennedy, the assassination of Martin Luther King, the uh, Vietnamese War, the uh, uh, problems that the country was roiling in at that time. That was a very, very strong influence uh, in terms of deciding that that's what I wanted to do. So that's why I wound up uh, in law school at the time. Presidential appointments to the federal bench are decidedly political and are part of an administration's legacy. But Bat says a judge's job is to steer clear of politics and offer a fair interpretation of the law. Are they coming in tomorrow? The federal judgeship is a lifetime appointment, but I do think that the system of checks and balances works. Judges stay out of the policy-making role. Have I done this one before? And get into the fray or come into action once the legislature has done its job. 
One place where BATS is able to be more vocal on the ways gays and lesbians continue to be denied equal protection under the law is at Fordham University, where she is a visiting professor. Her courses have focused on family law, marriage, and adoption. If we all agree that families and marriage, for instance, uh, provides positive uh, effects on the individuals who are part of them, uh, then one might wonder what legitimate interest uh, the state would have in, in preventing individuals who wish to uh, take advantage of those relationships. As a, as a private person and as a mother, anybody who wants to do and experience what I have should be given every opportunity to do so. Working toward getting more openly gay and lesbian individuals appointed at the federal level is a slow and contentious process, but a crucial one that can lead to social change. There are ways that judges can create social change, and one is simply by the example of that they are there and that they are in a very revered, prominent position in our society as an openly gay person. And in and of itself, that is social change and it inspires social change. A judge uh, requires being viewed as fair and impartial so that political action is, is something that we are not really able to do as judges, but we still are people. of the marriage movement. In the following 2008 I, I In the Life conversation, argument. Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist no, and Washington Post editorial writer Jonathan Capehart spoke with NAACP chairman about Julian Bond about the intersection of gay rights and civil rights. You've been chairman of the NAACP since 1998, correct? Right. How has the organization changed or evolved since the civil rights movement? Well, it has... Um change focus in a slight way, because we've always had the same focus, which is fighting racial discrimination. We've done that since 1909, and I, I'm sorry to say we'll probably be doing it for some time in the future. Let's talk about the time back during the, the Civil Rights Movement. You've said that there were many gays and lesbians involved in the movement, of course, and you credited them with shaping your views on gay rights. Did you know Bayard Rustin? Yes. Talk about Bayard Rustin. He was part of Dr. King's inner circle. He helped pull off the March on Washington in 1963, and he was gay. He, as, as you say, he was just a, a seminal figure in this movement because King depended on Bayard for so many things. He was King's first educator in nonviolence, and he just expanded King's knowledge of this a hundredfold. You know, Bayard wrote the first article ever published under Dr. King's name. Hmm. I think it was, I'm not sure it was in The Nation magazine, but uh, an article sort of revisiting the Montgomery bus boycott and saying what it meant, and Bayard Rustin wrote that. To say he organized the March on Washington really doesn't give him enough credit. Mm -hmm. he, he put this thing together. Now, we're used to, you know, big protests in, in Washington nowadays. They happen, it seemed, almost every week or so. But this was almost a first, and it was certainly the first involving black people. And it was a first involving bringing people from all over the country here in Washington for this event. And Rustin just was such a superb organizer. Uh, he pulled it off and no problem. You are one of the few prominent members of the civil rights movement to come out full square in favor of gay marriage. It just seems to me something right to do. Uh, it seems to me that the right to be married is a civil right and I believe civil rights ought to be extended to everybody. Who, who ought not have these rights? What, what category of people ought not have these rights? I can't think of one. I've been married twice, and I know how, what the benefits are, the economic benefits are to a couple. And uh, I don't want to shut other people off from these benefits. You opened the 20th Annual Creating Change Conference, um, sponsored by the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And you said then, quote, 
Like race, our sexuality is not a preference. It's, it is immutable, unchangeable, and the Constitution protects us all against prejudices and discrimination based on immutable differences. What do you say to those who flat out disagree with that assessment? Well, if they seem to be open to some kind of rational argument, <laughs> then I, I try to make a rational argument. Your sexuality is an immutable characteristic. It's something you're born with. You don't say, hey, I think I'll be gay. Uh, you are gay when you're born or you're not gay. So what is the connection between the civil rights movement and the gay civil rights movement as we know it today? At the bottom, it's these immutable characteristics. You are what you are, and you cannot be discriminated against in this country for what you are. That's, that's the similarity, that's the closeness, and, and the fact that the black civil rights movement came to public attention before the gay civil rights movement, which is existing at the same time, but I don't think well known to people. These draw from each other, and the gay movement draws tactics and techniques and, and songs and slogans, as did the uh, Hispanic movement, as did the women's movement. And it's not that these movements are taking from us. Uh, because the black movement took from other movements before us. We took from the labor movement. And I never heard of people from the labor movement complaining about this. Mm -hmm. And for black people to complain about this, we ought to be proud of this. Say, look what we did. We created a model that other people have followed. And they followed it successfully. Good for us. The widow of Dr. Martin Luther King, that was Coretta Scott King. Mm -hmm. Did you ever talk about this? No, I never sure. did. I never talked to her about this. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I quoted her as often as I could. And when she died, and it was announced that Ebenezer Baptist Church, where her uh, husband had been pastor, was too small for the funeral ceremony, and it was instead headed for a church run by a notorious homophobic mm. minister in Atlanta, I decided not to go. What should gay people know about her that they might not already know? Well, first, I don't think many of them know that she was this strong advocate for uh, gay rights, for uh, all of the things that gay people want and need. Uh, I think her advocacy of these things is relatively unknown. And when I speak to audiences and quote her, I can see some of the people saying, really? You know, happily, but really? And so. I think they could learn some more about her. She was in many ways a remarkable person, and to think of her as the, the wife and widow of Martin Luther King in some ways diminishes her, because she was more than that, she was greater than that, she had a life of her own, she was an independent person, uh, so of course she was the wife, of course she was the mother, of course she was the standard bearer after he died, but she was more than that. Mm -hmm. You have gone basically around the country um, campaigning against um, anti-gay marriage amendments uh, in, various, in, in various states. Do you, were you, I mean, did you voluntarily do this? Did people come to you and say, you know, we could really use your name and your stature behind this? Both those things happened. Um, the NAACP uh, is opposed to these amendments. We don't have a position on marriage equality. We're neutral on that or agnostic on that. Uh, but we do oppose these amendments because we think it's wrong to single out any group of people for special treatment. And that's what these amendments do. And so wherever they've ra raised their heads, we've campaigned against them. And where I've been able to physically go, uh, I've done it myself. Here's the closing cosmic question. I am... Um a 17, 18-year-old um, black kid anywhere in, in the United States, urban America, rural America, suburban America, exurban America, and I just don't get the connection, that there is even a connection between the civil rights movement that you helped lead and the gay rights movement that I see all sorts of people uh, pushing and leading from people on television to people in politics, um, people in business. Why, one, why should I care? And two, what is, the, what is the connection? Convince me. The connection is rights. Rights, that's the key word. These are movements for rights. And these are movements to ensure that uh, everyone has these rights. And this 17-year-old kid uh, may not think 
he's ever going to get married, or if he's straight, uh, is going to marry a woman. But uh, this guarantees his rights. And if he's not interested in his rights, then I wouldn't spend much time talking with him. Thanks, Mr. Brown. Thank you. In 1995, African-American civil rights activists planned the Million Man March on Washington, D.C. to unite the black community against social and economic ills. One of the organizers of the march was the Reverend Louis Farrakhan, who made numerous homophobic statements on record. Keith Boykin, who was at the time the executive director of the National Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum, recounted to In the Life how black gay men stood proud in response. The National Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum a board of directors met in September of 1995 to discuss the issue of the Million Man March. At that time, there was some concern about whether we wanted to encourage our members or other black lesbians and gay men to participate. After very serious and careful discussion and debate, we decided that we would encourage people to participate, but only if they were to do so openly and visibly about who they were, not to hide a part of their identity or not to be ashamed of who they were. And certainly there to be ready to challenge any sort of homophobia that might come up or any sort of instances of sexism that we felt were of concern. So it was important that we participate and we participate on our own terms. After that decision was made, we organized a series of activities around the march, uh, cultural, social, political activities, including our own rally. And we marched into the, um, onto the mall where the event occurred and we would warmly receive very enthusiastic, positive responses. I, I felt all along the march route, the, uh, the throng of black men who lined the streets and who were in the streets parted like the Red Sea when we came through chanting gay men of African descent. I mean, it was just a wonderful, powerful, motivating, moving, inspiring experience for me, I think for all the people who were there. I think what we learned from this experience, though, was that when we come out and when we are not ashamed about who we are as black gay men and lesbians, that our community, the black community, not only, uh, they not only accept us, they respect us more. Before the Stonewall Rebellion, there was a group of ordinary citizens taking a stand and picketing for gay rights in front of Independence Hall in Philadelphia. In the Life remembers the pioneering work started by Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings. This is the front of the famous Independence Hall in Philadelphia, and this is where we had gay picketing demonstrations every July 4 from 1965 through 1969. People think of the Stonewall Rebellion as uh, uh, the start of the gay civil rights movement. That's a myth. There was a movement starting back in the late 1940s and it gradually evolved and it picked up steam and we were doing this very revolutionary picketing in the 1960s before Stonewall ever happened. These are, these are stacks of various gay-related uh, picketing signs from a variety of demonstrations in Washington and also Philadelphia. In the middle 60s, um, activism and expressions of dissent hadn't uh, reached the levels that they did by the latter 60s and picketing in some such places as the front of the White House was the extreme expression of dissent par excellence. Things hadn't gone beyond that yet. There had been a big debate within the gay movement about whether or not we should have public demonstrations. And a lot of it was based on the fear we thought, boy, if somebody knew you were gay, they'd stone you to death or you know, attack you. you know, we didn't dare walk holding a sign saying that we were homosexuals. See, in those days, people thought it was very much smarter to uh, pass. And uh, 
that people who didn't want to pass were just inviting trouble. Nobody was out then. I was probably, certainly for example in my group down here, I was the only person who used my own name. Those early pickets were scary. It was scary because there were so few of us who could take the risk of being so public. For example, um, what if my boss sees me on the six o'clock news and fires me? Or what if my picture appears on the front page of my parents' hometown newspaper and causes grief or shockwaves in the town? And uh, what if some bystander starts throwing insults at us or worse, bricks or stones? Uh, and what is the government going to do with all those photographs and tape recordings that they're taking of us? We had a dress code. And it's easy now to look back 35 years later and uh, laugh at it and make fun of it because it was a very strict code. But I think it was appropriate for the time and I strongly supported it at the time. And I think it was right then because we were trying to get across a very unpopular message. We didn't want people to gawk at us. We wanted them to gawk at the messages on our signs in, and in our leaflets. Well, the philosophy um, was to make us look normal the way everybody else looked. So did we succeeded so well that, uh, as Frank Kameny said, um, some people thought we were actors. I remember specifically when we picketed in front of the Civil Service Commission, my, uh, I, um, my approach was, they, we want them to employ us. Therefore, within the normal mode of the day, uh, we have to give the appearance of being employable. We were representing, we felt, all those hundreds of thousands or millions of other Americans that were homosexual. This is independence. National what we saw it was a, a chance to remind uh, Americans on July 4th that we were equal citizens. And uh, what better place to do that than in front of the Liberty Bell? Independence Hall is where the thing was done. Both the uh, Declaration of Independence um, and uh, the Constitution were right there. It was right after the parade, the July 4th parade, and the, uh, the folding chairs were stacked up still and, then, and everything had been dismantled, the bleachers. And so then we came on and, and picketed it. I just felt a sense of, of uh, commitment and a sense of uh, passionate involvement. You know, it didn't bother me if people were negative, and there was a surprising lack of negativity there on the part of bystanders. I think they, they were surprised, but they didn't give us any trouble that I recall. There was a photographer there who told me that all I needed was a good man, you know. Just, or perhaps he even said that all I needed to do was sleep with the man. And, and I, I said something like I didn't need that or something and I, I just filmed, you know, and he stuck out his tongue at me. Otherwise, uh, it went off fine, and then uh, at the end, uh, um, on a signal, everybody, uh, we had, you know, signs on sticks, and everybody, flipped down their signs, the demonstration was over. Once the flag lowering music that was from the loudspeaker uh, started and we saw the flag lowering, we all stood and uh, put our right hand over our heart. Just to show that we were uh, good patriots, and we respected the flag, you know, we were first class American citizens and we have wanted, that's a message we have wanted, we had wanted to tell everyone from the beginning. We are first class citizens. We are not marginal people. I feel that those demonstrations led directly into Stonewall in 69 and that without our demonstrations starting in 65, Stonewall would not have happened because what they did was to create the mindset for gay people who had never ever before done this to demonstrate publicly, to dissent publicly, to, to do things out in the open. 
and no, nobody had ever done this before. The 1969 demonstration took place just about a week after the Stonewall Rebellion in New York City. A lot of people who were fired up by the fight against the police at Stonewall came down to Philadelphia or came from other cities into Philadelphia and joined the demonstration and it was the largest we had ever had. There were about 150 people. That sounds like very little today, but for us it was a huge turnout. Here we saw uh, men in blue jeans, t-shirts. We saw a mixture, and it's that, like the transition from the old to the new. All of this, it, it was sort of a movement pulling itself up by its bootstraps. If you want to pursue the metaphor, we created the bootstraps, and then other people pulled and pulled and pulled, and up it went. And uh, pretty soon you have um, marches on Washington with hundreds of thousands of people. You know, coming out in a picket line in 1965 was downright revolutionary for that time. It took gumption. It really took gumption and the conviction that we were right and the world was wrong. We were just at the start of cracking that cocoon of invisibility. Thank you for watching In the Life. To watch more historical coverage from the last 20 years of In the Life, visit our website at itlmedia.org. We were working for rights and for a full first class of citizenship in our society, and we were never going to get it as long as their ideas prevailed. You had a whole establishment that had to be changed and reversed. And in order to get them to do that, you had to use political tactics. If we don't attend to the violence, if we don't address violence, if we don't look at the underlying causes of it, not only homophobia, religious extremism, and government autocracy, we are never going to be able to really achieve, achieve our goals, which are human rights for LGBT people everywhere. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmering and Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, Dewey and LaBeouf, and these funders, and by the annual support of In the Life members like you.